All right. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to Ask Me Anything. Today's guests, we have Kenny, uh, Kara Breeden and Jenny Black. I was about to combo y'all's names. <laughs> That's fine too. <laughs> we'll accept that. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, nice to be here. So for those of you who have not participated in Ask Me Anything, uh, we are here to answer questions. So if you have questions, post them in the comments. Uh, we want to hear from you, our members, for any questions you may have from the field. So for today, patient empowerment through community-based forensic nursing programs. Ask me anything with Jenny Black and Kara Breeden. So we'll go ahead and get started. Y'all ready? Yes. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. <clears throat> so the first question, what is the difference between a sane nurse and a forensic nurse? Jenny, you want to take this one or you want me to? Huh? Sure, I'd be glad to. So a sane nurse is one kind of a forensic nurse. Forensic nursing is a much bigger umbrella. And those folks are nurses who uh, step in and help people who've experienced any kind of interpersonal violence. It might be somebody who has recently experienced a sexual assault. That's what sane nurses specialize in. But it also might be somebody who has experienced some kind of neglect our child abuse or a gunshot wound or many other things like that. What am I missing, Kara? Domestic violence, strangulation, you know, elder abuse. Right. Um, I think it's important that the, um, our partners understand this because I think, you know, we became known as sane nurses and I'm very thankful for that. But I think it, um, at this time and where we're at, um, I think it's important that we uh, make sure our partners all know that we can do so much more. Um, and that we can be utilized with a lot of different patient populations. So um, I really think understanding the distinction between the two is, is crucial um, to be able to help, you know, more victims of violence. Right. As, as they perhaps begin a journey through the criminal justice system, because that's what the forensic part means. It's where we combine healthcare and the criminal justice system. Right. All right. That's good to know. I don't think I knew that before mm -hmm. that uh, seeing nurses hold a smaller part. Forensic nurse is more broad. So thank you. Next question is, what is a community-based forensic nurse program and how does it change the patient experience? Ooh, you go first on this one. Okay. Um, well, community-based just really means that, you know, a lot of times other programs are owned by a specific entity, like maybe a hospital. I think the other more common model is a hospital-based program. So I'll use that as a comparison. Um, com community-based means that we are in the community. Uh, we're not usually bound by hospital walls, if you will. Um, so for TX Stephanie, for example, uh, we have six clinic locations placed throughout our community. And then we partner with over 30, 35 hospitals within our community as well. So we are combined. We see patients in a hospital. We see patients in clinics. We can kind of do what the community needs us to do and meet patients where they're at um, and, and not make them jump through hoops to go from place to place to be able to get a, a specific service. So I think the community-based aspect of it um, expands what we can do. It makes it easier for access and um, it really lets us decide on, you know, how we want to best um, meet that patient where they're at, really. Um, you have been doing this a lot longer than I have, Jenny, and it's taught me it so much. You want to add, you want to add some to that? Sure. So just by way of background, Kara's program and folks are in the Houston area and our program is in the Austin area. Um, I think one of the biggest differences, at least for us, is that we don't charge people anything. Right. Our primary site to see folks who have experienced a recent sexual assault is on the grounds of a rape crisis center in Travis County in Austin. So that program and us within that agency, we don't charge folks anything. We don't ask to see people's IDs. We don't ask to see people's insurance. And I think that that has taken a barrier out of the way for people seeking care. When we started our program back in the middle of 2015, our, our hospital-based program census was running around 485 a year. And this is adults and adolescents only, and again, just sexual assault folks. Um, when we moved 
out into the community and took having to pay an emergency department out of the picture, we saw almost 600 people our first year. So I think that was a pretty significant difference. I'm not surprised by that at all. Yeah. I think the other thing when you talk about um, money, I think that's a huge factor. Um, I think it helps people remain, um, I think it gives them a little bit more confidentiality. But I also think when we talk about issues such as immigration, status, and things like that, it also opens doors for patients to be a little less fearful of repercussions from immigration related issues as well. I know we get a lot of phone calls um, to ask us those questions specifically. So I think those are other things that really, um, you know, open the doors for these victims that might not otherwise seek services. Right. Yeah, exactly so. And like you all, we are able to go to hospitals in our community. We're serving four counties right now, a couple of different hospital networks. So for people who need to go to an emergency department because they've sustained injuries that require that kind of care, or for people who are already in the hospital, like maybe in an intensive care unit and needing to have that kind of care, we can go to those places to provide evidence collection and consultations and the support and help that we normally do outside of a hospital. Right. Right. So I have a follow-up question to that. Um, Just out of curiosity, I know that some hospitals report that they need like the case from law enforcement in order to assist sometimes with survivors. Uh, Is that the same instance when they come to see y'all or is it just kind of like whatever they need uh, patient care wise? Yeah, I think that's a misapprehension, right? Because for adult people, I mean, people who are 18 and not yet 65, you don't have to talk to the police after experiencing sexual assault. That is a very personal choice. And it's always dismaying when that gets misunderstood anywhere along the response system. And police may be called in when when that's not what somebody wants to have happen. So when we meet with people who come to see us, we start with absolutely zero assumptions about anything and say, well, here are the things that we do. What would you like to engage in? How can we be helpful to you? And it's fine if none of the stuff that we do is something that makes sense to that person at that time. We we just are here to serve people in whatever capacity they would like. Thank you. All right, so the next question I have, what is patient empowerment? Your turn to go first. Okay. (laughs) So in in a broad context, we want to allow the people that we work with and engage with in our lives to make their own decisions about things without any pushing, without any coercion, without any, well, you ought to, or that kind of thing. So we come from a place where we again offer choices and information and and help the patients that come to see us navigate through those decisions with information and when folks decide they don't want to do things that we offer we also talk about you know what it means to decline certain things and what the potential consequences are down the line we give the power that we have as healthcare providers who are often directive, right? I mean, who hasn't been to an emergency department where they tell you, I'm gonna do this to you and I'm gonna do that to you. And that's not how we approach things at all. And so we have this to offer. What do you think about that? What I'd like to do next is this. Here is what we're gonna do. Here is how we do it. Here's why we do it. Would that be okay with you? Particularly in cases where somebody has experienced a sexual assault and had those choices taken away from them. We want to give those right back to people immediately and create a different context and a different environment for them. I don't have that. I don't have that. It's one of the most important things we do. Um, you know, I think that stands for us as forensic nurses, but as well as our advocacy partners that we work with. I think when we go hand in hand, I think that's um, the single most important thing that we do for our patient population is start to give them their power back. Um, so yeah, but I don't have anything to add. All right. Well, real quickly, we're going to go to the comments. Okay. So folks, I just want to remind you that if you have any questions, please post them in the comments. We will answer your questions while we're live. We got about 10 minutes left. I'm going to jump into a question that Jenny and Kara 
didn't know I was going to ask today. <laughs> the mystery question. The mystery question. Don't worry, I, I made it super easy. <laughs> so, going back to my questions. And I also want to share the screen. <laughs> Bam. What is one thing you hope to do before summer ends? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I know it's a loaded question right now. I know, so loaded. I would actually really like to um, get a beach house and just be socially distanced from everyone, but um, enjoy a different um, scenery, just as you posted here. Um, the scenery of my backyard, which has been a saving grace through all of this, um, is wonderful, but I'm ready for a different set of scenery. <laughs> I understand so, that. That would be excellent. Yep, so many things, but <laughs> this picture takes me right to, I wanna go swimming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, it wasn't supposed to be a leading image. It just happened to be what I did this summer that I really wanted to do, which was mm -hmm. so, so socially distant swim. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it looks yeah. relaxing. Self care all the way. It's pretty nice. It's in Wimberley if you're interested. Oh. <laughs> yes, yeah. gonna ask you for details later. Sounds good. <laughs> so we all agree, swimming is the the, the big thing. <laughs> Definitely, I understand that. All right. Well, thanks, y'all. Mm -hmm. So we'll go ahead and continue on. So how do you work with advocates? Ooh, that's a great question. Do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, I'll be honest. And um, when we launched, we launched last March and I had an advocate that was written in our grant. Um, I knew we wanted to have an advocate, but I didn't know what it would be like having an advocate work alongside us day to day. Um, I just had never had that before. I came from a hospital-based program and we called advocates in to do you know, to be with patients during our exams. And that's kind of the uh, relationship I had had to that point. And so when Caitlin, bless her heart, joined us, um, she quickly, like, she's the glue of this organization. I always say that. I tell her that all the time. Yeah. Um, she not only is, like, from a uh, follow-up perspective for our patients, um, it, it's just amazing because when we go see these patients, we do we do all these things to help them get their get their power back and all this stuff. But then I know when I was at the hospital, we would discharge them, and you never knew like, are they really going to get connected with a counselor? Are they really going to get you know um, whatever it is they need? Right? They need a hundred things, and it's every, every time it's different. So you never really knew if they were going to get what they needed, right? And so having somebody here that you work along with side day in and day out that if you're you know super concerned about something whatever aspect of that exam it was whether it's safety or bed sheets or whatever um having someone that you work so closely with that can take whatever that situation is and make sure it, it gets taken care of for that victim is just you can't even put words to it it's like i remember one day um a patient i took care of was very very upset because the police department took her comforter as evidence. I mean, that's standard, right? We know they do that kind of thing. She was just so upset about this because she, she didn't have another comforter. She didn't have any, like this, this is her, you know, her, her thing. And, you know, Caitlin spent, I swear, six to eight hours calling to different, you know, services and all these different partners. And we got our brand new bed set and we got it, you know, like we figured all that out. And just to have somebody that can spend that kind of time to um, help with whatever th that tip for that survivor, that was that was her main concern is that bed set, you know, and so we were help we were able to help do that. So I know that was kind of, it's kind of a quirky story, but I think without an advocate working alongside us like that, there's just like it, our, our work would not be as meaningful for sure. That is setting Yeah. Same here. It's it's been a really interesting and fruitful and wonderful experience to be embedded right. in the rape crisis center. We we call advocacy the other side of our house. And somebody the other day was like, "It's our duplex. Which side of the duplex are you on?" 
Right. So we, we meet with our advocacy team every week. Mm-hmm. We problem solve with our advocacy team every Monday morning for things that have come up over the weekend. It allows us, like you're talking, Kara, to do a lot more case management. What do people need? How can we get short-term needs met in a hurry for folks? Right. And it might be housing. It might be safety. It might be protective order. It might yeah. be a comforter. It could be anything. It could be coming into shelter and I need somebody who can take care of my dog. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So we, it, it allows us on the nursing side to have a little bit longer contact period with people. And that's, I think that's helpful for us for a couple of reasons. One of them, we all want to be helpful. And the second one is it, I think it reduces our burnout in some ways to know that people are moving forward and that they're okay. Yeah. And when they're not, it allows us an opportunity to intervene in the system because we don't just see patients. We work with our law enforcement partners. We work with our partners in prosecution yeah. to improve processes and make things flow better for the people that we all serve. And, and working with advocates gives us, I don't know, superpowers. <laughs> No, I agree. Access other tools, other perspectives, and it's it's a wonderful collaboration. I I want everybody to work closely with advocates all the time, forever. Well, and I think one thing that helps. Um, I know uh, Caitlin, um, our advocate here, uh, she does a lot of um, check-ins with the staff. You know, um, especially you know she uh, kind of knows what the cases look like and whatnot, just because she's following up and doing that sort of thing. So especially when we have some, like some, some of the more difficult cases to kind of swallow, if you will, she'll make sure to, you know, pull them in and do some kind of one-on-one to make sure they're okay, which is really nice because, you know, we know the burnout rate in this field is just so high. And so it's, it's nice to have someone else looking out for, for the nurses here too. I think that's a critical thing in a whole other subject is is how do we all deal with the trauma exposure that we face on a daily basis? And that's a really brilliant way to do that. Yeah. I'm glad you guys have that. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. So we do have a question. Um, It's really just kind of jumping back. To the swimming pool? I mean, that would be wonderful. Someone asked if we could repeat the difference between forensic nurse and sane nurse. So if you want to do like a quick summation, a recap, if you will. Yeah, you go, Kara. Okay. Um, So really and truly, the sexual assault nurse examiner is just one type of forensic nursing. So forensic nursing, I like to say, is the bigger umbrella uh, that houses all the other things that we can do. So it's the sexual assault nurse examiner. It's the care of the domestic violence patient, um, care of you know, trafficking and strangulation and elder abuse and child abuse and even suspects if you really want to include that. Um, So the forensic nurse is more encompassing of all the different uh, specialties that we can take care of. And the same nurse just focuses on that sexual assault nurse examiner, that sexual assault component. So um, forensic nurse is just a broader term. All right, perfect. And then now circling back, and you guys talked about this a little bit, but I'm curious to know specifically to your groups, how do you address staff burnout? So many ways. We are acutely aware of that and, and focus on that from the time that we interview people. When folks are interested in working with us on the nursing side of the house, we recommend that they get a relationship with a therapist if they don't have one already because It's not a matter of if you're gonna be affected by it, it's a matter of when and how easily you can recognize it and what resources you have to process it so that it doesn't end up causing you troubles. We do chart reviews of every single case. We sit down with a couple of nurses and go through documentation and part of that quality assurance process is a check-in. How are you doing? How was this for you? What do you need? How can we be helpful? We have monthly staff meetings that sometimes we'll have um, employee assistance providers come to, folks who are social workers or therapists to come and do like a group debrief when something's been particularly difficult. We recommend that folks read trauma stewardship. We recommend that folks talk amongst themselves. We recommend that people let us know when things seem sticky or uncomfortable so that we can problem solve together. But we talk about this stuff amongst ourselves every day. 
Yeah, absolutely. I really, besides all of those wonderful things, I try to make sure that we're having a little fun, uh, mm -hmm. that we have, you know, lunches together. We have a kitchen here at our office. And so we'll, you know, bring things and have, you know, staff lunches and staff outings and, you know, um, brunch or whatever we, whatever the thing is, I think, you know, collaborating as um, a group in uh, with something positive, I think is helpful too, because we're kind of in the trenches, trenches together and, and do all this stressful work together. So I think it's fun to kind of spend time and debrief together as well um, in a positive way. Yeah, relationships I think are huge. Wonderful. Well, thank you both. We are at the end of time. I just want to let y'all know if you have any additional questions, you can follow up with Kara or Jenny at the emails listed below. I will also throw that into the Facebook chat at the end of the video. Um, and some last things in case you forgot, just ask me anything, you post your questions. We still want to hear from you. And the way you can send us your questions, you can still post them in the comments. Or if you have ideas for future AMAs that you would be interested in, you can go to our AMA forums. You can submit um, ideas of what you would like to hear about or people you would like to hear from or what specific topics. Um, yes. And if you have questions for me, you can contact me at cclark at tasa.org. So that is it for the day. Thank you both for joining me. And uh, folks, again, if you have questions, throw them in the comments. We'll follow up with you on Facebook. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>